A retired U.S. Army general, he is a distinguished leader and champion for developing leaders of all kinds. From West Point to Harvard, his academic background is truly second to none. Currently, he serves as Associate Dean for Leadership Development and Inclusion at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Please join me and my guest, Dean Bernie Banks, in the arena right now. Three, two, one. Dean Banks, <laughs> to have you in the arena is truly an honor to say. Thank you for being here. It is wonderful to be here today. Yes. Um, I think it's safe to say it's been about, uh, what, half a decade since we first met. Um, I remember vividly uh, I was one of 75 executives taking a leadership course at uh, Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, where you happen to be the leadership professor. Um, and, you know, I'm so excited about this conversation because you made such an impression on myself and all my colleagues. Um, and I'm so thrilled to talk about our subtopic today, which the tenet is leadership redefined. And I remember often you talked about how we need to start to think about growing leaders in new ways. And I'm so interested in uncovering and unpacking what that looks like for you. But before we get there, can you describe your upbringing and talk about maybe how uh, you grew up, what was that like? Were there some fun moments? What were your parents like? Who are your parents? Let's start there. Yeah. So first, I would say that I was very fortunate to have an upbringing that I personally characterize mm. as wonderful. Grew up all over the United States due to my father being an active duty military officer throughout my childhood. Mm. So I was born in Columbus, Ohio, which is my mother's hometown. My father was originally from Lynchburg, Virginia. My parents met at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, a historically black college. My father was subsequently drafted into the military during the Vietnam War, was sent to officer candidate school and became a helicopter pilot. So his activities took us all over the United States. Consequently, I have lived in a variety of places. And so I like to call myself a social chameleon of sorts and that I've learned how to enter into a new environment, quickly assess what are the norms, values, beliefs associated with the people here, and then start to figure out ways in which I could build enduring relationships. And so my childhood, while nomadic, has proven very useful in terms of what I do professionally, mm -hmm. because my career has also required me to utilize those same skills because I moved through assignments during the military in rapid succession. Ultimately, my family settled in New Jersey, around 50 miles south of New York City, mm. in Monmouth County, what's commonly referred to as the Jersey Shore. And that's where I went to high school. I was a varsity athlete in a number of sports, did very well in school, did very well in sports, was fortunate to have a number of wonderful opportunities for college, elected to go to the United States Military Academy at West Point, which was a childhood dream of mine. And so I entered into West Point with the class of 1987. There I was a varsity athlete. I played football like you. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed my time at the academy, made lifelong friends, and most certainly the ethos of the academy is something that still resonates with me to this very day. Mm -hmm. This notion of honoring one's duty, conducting oneself with honor, focusing on bigger picture, whether that's country, organization, community, you name it. And so my upbringing was one that, while characterized by a lot of diversity, there were some very common elements around the importance of striving for excellence, honoring family, trying to make a positive difference in your community, learning how to compete, win with dignity, lose with dignity, and a variety of other things. So yeah, yeah it was no, good. No, it's beautiful. And I love how you talked about family and and it sounds like family is the tenet of how you grew up. And I'm, I'm just curious to know, and you know, so thinking about the fact that your father uh, was in the military, um, how much influence did that have on you making a decision to 
follow a similar path to join the military. And um, I know you have sons. Um, how has that impacted your parenting skills? Is this something that you hope and expect your kids to maybe consider <laughs> the military? Yeah, it's a great question. So I like to say I am the ultimate love child in that my father mm. was a military aviator and my mother was a school psychologist. Mm. Ultimately, I became a military aviator who's trained as an organizational psychologist. <laughs> and so we always are influenced to some extent by our environment. Now, the interesting thing is my father never actively sought to promote the military as a desired destination. He most certainly exposed me to it, but he never had an agenda with respect to, I think this is something you should pursue. Yeah. That was completely my choice because of how much I respected my father yeah. and the nature of what he did was very appealing to me. I like the adrenaline, I like the complexity, I like the teamwork. So all of that I personally found to be desirable. So my parents never pushed the military on me, but because of what I was exposed to, I had not only developed a deep interest, but I also respected the man my father was. And I wanted to be the kind of man that uh, he sought to embody through his actions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure you probably heard this, but there's this idea that uh, when you think of military parents, you think of discipline. Um, and was that true for you growing up? Was your father a disciplinarian? Um, and, and, <laughs> and are you that to your kids? Like about actually your, your, your young adults now, uh, would, they, would they refer to their father, uh, you, as someone who might be a disciplinarian? My kids would absolutely say I'm a disciplinarian. <laughs> but the funny thing was, my mother was a disciplinarian. Mm, interesting. And my father was way more laid back. Yeah. yeah. And so discipline was most certainly present in our home in that there were clear rules. We were held to account for our behavior. There was a recognition that you needed to work for things. Things were not going to simply be handed to you. And so I grew up with clear structure, but I didn't grow up in a home that I felt was overbearing or you know, lacked joy. There was lots of laughter, yeah. but laughter could quickly turn to a stern <laughs> look if I wasn't doing the right thing. Yeah. And I think that's very much what's present in our home as well. I like to tell my kids, I am happy to keep it light as long as we keep it tight. Yeah. But I once like we are no longer tight, <laughs> light's probably going to go out the window. <laughs> We're going to tighten things up. Yeah. And then we'll go back to being light again. Yeah. And so my yeah. kids will most certainly tell you, dad is demanding. Yeah. But I also strive to ensure they understand dad is loving. Yeah. So if, and last thing about your kids, um, you know, I'm a, uh, a dad to a nine-year-old daughter. And I often think about you know, um, when my time does come and I move on, um, what she would probably most remember me by. And, and so I wanna ask you, if you were to leave something <laughs> for your kids to remember you by, what would that one thing be you hope when they think of their father to remember you by? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have a concept I call hug and push. And hug and push means that I will always seek to push my kids to become the next best version of self. I am intent on never letting the grass grow beneath their feet. But the entire time I'm pushing, they need to know I'm hugging on them at the same time. So I'll always be right there by their side. I'll always strive to ensure that they know I've got their back. But I am never going to let them be static. And so this notion of how do you push while how do you support, I hope that my kids recognize that in terms of how I sought to raise them and how I've sought to support them over time, that I was there to push them, not to achieve things of my choosing, but to help them figure out what it would take to achieve their own dreams. Yeah. But at the same time, understanding, hey, we're all going to have missteps. There are going to be moments where we might feel periods of despair, and in those moments, 
know that I'm always right there with you. Yeah. And so that's beautiful. I hope they remember that. All right, that's that's very beautiful. And 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 I'm going to read up from my page here because I want to talk about something um, that is one of the things that is also very impressive about your achievements. Right. So with degrees from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, as you mentioned earlier, Central University, Central Michigan University, Harvard University, Northwestern University, Columbia University, United States War College, and you've taught Columbia University, Northwestern University, where you're currently the Associate Dean of Leadership Development and Inclusion. I mean, wow. So, so my question is, did you always have a, a personal goal to achieve such significant academic success? Is this something that <laughs> my mom would usually say, it's divine intervention, it just kind of happened? <laughs> or I'm just curious, like how? Work, walk us through that journey of making the decision or that process of achieving so, I mean, for, for many of us, I just want to get one of these. And I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm probably keep saying it's a great question. You keep asking great <laughs> questions, Jimmy. My goodness. So I was always intent on pursuing a world-class education. That was an objective I had set at a young age. I wanted to go to a school that was held in high regard. West Point most certainly fit the bill for that. And I was intent on pursuing at least a master's degree at a world-class institution. But I was not intent on doing that multiple times. Mm. And I most certainly did not have a doctorate as something that I aspired to obtain early on in my career. But to understand the story of those schools, you have to understand something that happened at one of those schools. So we go back to my upbringing. I was a good student. I had certain natural gifts. And those gifts allowed me to achieve certain outcomes without having to put significant effort into it. Well, natural gifts will only get you so far. And they got me as far as West Point. Yeah. And so once I got to West Point, the demands of the curriculum intersected with my natural proclivities, and the demands were greater than my natural gifts. Yeah. And so my grades were not great. They weren't bad, but they weren't stellar. I like to say I was comfortably numb in the top half of the bottom third mm -hmm. of my graduating class. Mm -hmm. Now, West Point is a corporate university in that everyone who graduates must go in the military for a period of at least five years. And you're competing for what function you will go into upon graduation and where you will be stationed for your first assignment. All I want to be was a pilot. It was the only thing I want to be. And flight school slots are highly prized, so they go out fairly high in the class. Now, once again, I wasn't making either dean's list, the good or the bad one. And I knew it would be close. I was like, mm, I don't know if this is going to turn out well. And so we go into our senior year, and we're about to go in the auditorium where they're going to tell us based on the preferences you submitted, here's what you're getting for your function. And we're about to go into the auditorium, and my dear friend Gary turns to me and said, man, you look nervous. And I was like, <laughs> I am. I, I am nervous. <laughs> I, I, I got a bad feeling. I don't think this is going to go down well. And Gary goes, Bernie, it always turns out for you. And I was like, yeah, it does. And so off we go. So we enter in there. Long story short, they hand us these envelopes. I open the envelope. I didn't get it. I got my second choice, which was field artillery, which is cannons and stuff like that. And my world imploded. Mm. At that time, my parents were living in Izmir, Turkey. And so this is the 80s. This is before unlimited talk, unlimited text. Making a <laughs> phone call to Izmir, Turkey in 1986 was a very expensive undertaking. Yeah. And I'm speaking to my mom, and I'm sobbing uncontrollably. And she couldn't understand what I was saying. I was like, I didn't get it. And I went into a deep funk for several weeks. Mm. My parents were going to fly back from Turkey. I was like, there's nothing you can do about it. Stay there. And then they issued some additional information. They showed, here's each function. 
Here's the first person who requested it and got it. Here's the last person who got a slot. And then they drew a line and shows everyone else who wanted it as their first choice in order where did they rank. And so for flight school, the last name was Fred Wellman. The name right below that, right under the line, was Bernard Bennett Banks. Mm. I had missed my mm. life's ambition by one slot. And when I finally had the opportunity to process what had transpired, I recognized I hadn't been cheated. It's not as if they had changed the standards on me. I simply hadn't worked hard enough for the thing I said was most important to me. And in that moment, I swore that I would never let apathy mm. determine anything in my life Hello. ever again, nor will it determine the fate of anyone I cared about. Because if somebody had been pushing me to a greater extent, that might not have occurred. But because I wasn't failing anything, but I wasn't setting the world on fire, I was kind of left on my own. Yeah. And what we see in organizations is many times we glob onto those who are doing really well, give them a lot of love. Those who aren't doing what they're supposed to, they get a lot of negative love. And then everybody else is kind of left on their own. Yeah. And I learned a valuable lesson. As a leader, you must invest in everyone, not just those who are at the opposite ends yeah. of the performance spectrum. Yeah. And so from that, I kind of went on an academic bender. I was like, yeah. this will never happen again. I will only get A's, and I will strive to ensure that I am pushing myself to the greatest extent possible yeah. in order to amplify influence and provide opportunity yeah. for the teams I'm a part of. And so. Each one of those degrees that came afterwards was part of an effort to fill in a gap, prepare for a role, create opportunity, and they kind of just started growing Building. along the way, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's such a great context because, you know, if you can just bring us into your office for the moment, um, you are uh, an associate dean for leadership development at uh, not only one of the most prestigious, but one of the top business schools in the world. Um, and you know, you've invited me a number of times to come speak at some of your courses and talk to some of your uh, future leaders. Um, so it's always an honor. Thank you. Um, in this moment in time, uh, Dean Banks, um, we are seeing uh, a climate like maybe we haven't seen in a very long time. We are still recovering from a pandemic. We're facing an impending economic recession. We're seeing lay layoffs. Uh, we've heard about what's happening in the banking sector. Um, and once again, there's a call to leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember you telling me very vividly, in course, about this idea of growing leaders in a new way. Could you just talk about the type of leaders that would not only get us through this moment in time, but would hopefully develop future leaders in this yeah. moment in time? So many folks, when raised to think about leadership, think about it primarily through the lens of formal authority, mm. taking on teams where they have more people, greater resources. And so when you think about leadership as an authority-based construct, it informs how you go about exercising your role. Mm. If you're primarily using legitimate authority, reward, coercion, while those things can be very efficient, they don't necessarily get people to really buy in mm. to what's transpiring around them. They'll do it, but they don't necessarily truly resonate with what they're being asked to do. Today's leaders, because they're leading more diverse organizations, because the things they're having to navigate are more complex, they've got to have a different set of skills. They have to be far more empathic mm. than they might have been in the past because leadership is not about authority, it's about influence. And in order to influence people today, we need to know them in ways that heretofore we were previously encouraged not to do. Mm. We don't need to know anything about what they do outside of work. We don't really need to know anything about what they're passionate about. We enter into an organizational contract. They're obligated to do certain things and they do those things, we give them a benefit. If they don't do those things, they're punished in some way. But today, talent is voting in ways that heretofore they did not previously. Absolutely. And so when we see things like quiet quitting, quiet quitting isn't because the person is lazy. 
it's because the environment is one where there's a deficit of trust. Because maybe the leaders there haven't taken the time to really get to know them. They don't really know what matters to them. And so when we think about skill sets today, much greater empathy, cultural curiosity. Mm. How do you build resilience given that the environment is so chaotic that people are going to get major shocks all the time? Folks will say a pandemic might be a once in a lifetime event. But for countless people, the pandemic's just one in a series of crises they've gone through Absolutely. where, hey, my community was wrecked by a hurricane that supposedly was a once in a thousand years. But guess what? We've had three hurricanes in five years. And each time it's leveled significant portions of our community. Industries that collapse and industries mm. that rise. And so what people are being asked to do today, the amount of turbulence is far different. The people who are engaged in the act are more diverse than in the past. Absolutely true. And so leaders have to have a different set of skills to be able to navigate these environments, to influence people, and to sustain their motivation to do what's necessary to achieve a desired outcome. And so some folks say, well, you know, all of this stuff, you know, it might be a woke kind of thing <laughs> or whatever else, using that term as if it's yeah. bad. When we talk yeah. about woke, it's just greater empathy. Yeah greater curiosity, trying to be better with respect to how am I ensuring I'm meeting the interest and needs of this person while at the same time ensuring they're meeting the interests and needs of the organization. So there, there's an and and not an or there, it sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. One does not have to come at the expense of the other. But yet we use certain terms in a very pejorative way, much like the use of three letters, D, E, I. Initially, that started out as, this is an effort to ensure we're finding diverse talent, treating it equitably, and fostering an inclusive environment so that they can thrive. Hmm. It's come to be viewed as win-lose, redistributing the pie, not enlarging the pie. Hmm. And so DEI, despite having good intention, has now become this polarizing thing. And so at Kellogg, one of the things I encourage us to do, we don't use those three letters, we talk about the community experience which is something for everyone. Yeah. And that we're trying to create a community experience characterized by inclusion for all, ensuring that we keep people equitably, and that we bring diverse people to bear because homogeneous yeah. teams are outperformed by heterogeneous teams when addressing complex challenges. So whoever has the best talent and can harness that talent well, they tend to win the most. Wow. Listen, you, you brought that together so well um, I wish we had another hour to talk about this, but we've reached the end of the segment of this conversation. Can you believe it? Um, but uh, the good news is that we'll be right back uh, for Three for the Road. I'm Melissa Donaldson, and I like to call myself a curious boomer. Through that curiosity, I have found that when we engage with people from different generations, we are more alike than we are different. On Generation Flex, we will discuss the day's most interesting topics and discover each other's unique perspectives together. Join us Mondays at 7 p.m. on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and on the new CanTV Plus app. Thanks, we're back. Uh, this is called Three for the Road. So here are the rules. I'm gonna ask you three questions and you're gonna give me three direct answers. Ready? Okay. All right. What do you think the number one skill that humans should learn and master? Sustained curiosity. Now, what do I mean by that? We live in a world where things are continually changing and that the people we encounter are continually evolving. However, if we tend to seek certainty and comfort, then we'll never be able to understand the change that's transpiring or the people who are driving it. And so that ability to have sustained curiosity so that you can foster effective learning 
so that you can apply that insight to inform your actions and ensure your continued relevance, I think that's a skill you must possess. Amazing. What, in your opinion, has been the most significant aspect of your life thus far? Being surrounded by great people. Mm. I am very fortunate to have grown up in a very loving family. I am very fortunate to have served on teams where I was pushed by people that I genuinely respected and that I felt a deep obligation to help push them. And so people many times when they read your CV or bio, they'll highlight professional accomplishments, but each one of those accomplishments is a result of a community. And so my success is a result of their investments. You know, when we think about investments, I like words, words have meaning. Origin of words is a study called etymology. And when you think about investment, it actually started with a Latin word that meant clothing, vestra. Then it morphed into investry, which was into cloth. Mm. Investments are trying to like get into the fabric. And so people made investments in me that became part mm. of who I am. It became part of my fabric. And I seek to ensure that I'm trying to do things that can add value to their lives by making investments that hopefully will resonate and stay with them over time. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Uh, last and final question. If you could talk to your younger self, what advice would you give them? Push harder. Mm. Push harder. And push right away, not once you get warmed up. Dean Banks, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, a very special thanks to Darius Hillman for letting me take over the host and do this tonight. And thank you, Chicago and beyond, for tuning in. Before I go, I'd like to share a final thought with you. It was said of Abraham Lincoln. He was at his mother's bedside when she died. And her last words were, be somebody, Abe. And if that story is true, evidently he took it to heart and proceeded from that moment on to become somebody. That's the key to leadership. Be somebody for somebody. Until we meet again, take good care of yourself and those around you. Have a good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Incredible. This was great. Thank you so much.